to start, I'd like to introduce Sarah uh, Siebert. She has a master's in public health from the University of California at Los Angeles, and she's been working on uh, prevention and responses to violence against women and girls for at least 23 years. Uh, after several years of work in crisis response, she um, changed her focus somewhat and tried to work more on prevention. Since 2008, she's been working with Raising Voices and the SASA methodology, and she's been a in a leadership role for adapting that methodology to different countries around the world. She's currently working at Beyond Borders as a prevention, a violence against women and girls prevention specialist, um, and with Raising Voices as a technical advisor. Currently, she's based in the United States, I believe in, in Colorado. And she, um, but has she, sorry, Sarah has worked in several countries and lived in those countries around the world um, and has provided technical assistance to, to um, organizations implementing the SASA methodology. I wanted to say Just Governance Group first um, learned about um, the SASA methodology while we were doing research on how to um, communicate, use communication initiatives um, for, for um, ending violence against women and girls. And we also looked at that methodology to find out more about the application of most significant change. Um, the, sorry, I'm trying to forward my slide to the next slide. There we are. Wanted, we sent you yesterday a brief on most significant change and we wanted to make sure that you um, could see um, briefly the steps and why people want to use it. Um, Just Governance Group has tried to use it, but in a condensed version. It's participatory, obviously the high participation. Um, you select stories from the stakeholders directly involved in, in, the, in the project or development initiative. Um, and it's especially helpful if there's not a clear um, or there's not clarity on a higher level results and changes that uh, you want to, uh, you have planned for. But on the other hand, the, um, it's also helpful if you want to identify un unplanned changes, I believe. So step one, you define the, the domain of change, uh, like an issue. You decide how and uh, when to when to collect stories and from the stakeholders. Once you've collected those, you move to uh, selecting the most significant stories in a participatory manner, and then you're able to verify stories. So that. That is sort of a brief overview of most significant change. And now I would like to ask um, Sarah um, to start her presentation. And I will turn my screen off. Great. Thank you so much. And um, thank you to everyone for being here. I'm Sarah Siebert. I'll just start at the slideshow um, and talk a little bit about using most significant change to evaluate the prevention of ending violence against women and girls programming, specifically intimate partner violence prevention through SASA, the SASA methodology in Haiti. And I actually wear two hats <laughs> in my job. Um, I work for Raising Voices in Uganda that created the SASA methodology as a technical advisor. And I also work for Beyond Borders in Haiti. And I'll mostly be talking from the Haiti hat today because we're the ones that used 
uh, most significant change and, and continue to, to wish to do so um, with Sasa and Haiti. Um, I have to apologize, first of all, many of my colleagues would be very well placed in both Uganda and Haiti to be making this presentation and were there as well. Um, but internet and language <laughs> are the reasons that you get me today. I'm very happy to be with you. So uh, I did not create Sasa. Uh, Raising Voices created it before I joined them, just before I joined them. It was created by Raising Voices in Uganda in 2008. Um, and essentially, it's a phased community mobilization approach um, that has been proven effective at preventing intimate partner violence in a randomized control trial in 2014. Sasa itself is a word in Kiswahili that means now, as in now is the time to prevent violence against women and girls in the community. And it's also an acronym for a social change process, uh, Start Awareness, Support, and Action. And the focus is really on listening to communities and creating real community relationships um, over time and dialogue around change of social norms that promote violence against women to uh, become ones that prevent violence against women. Sasa, because of maybe the positive research results um, and just word of mouth, has been scaled in 30 countries in this iterative process over a decade, basically. It was revised then in a consultative process with all of these entities around the world that had used it in their own context, saying, here's what's working, here's what's not. Um, so it's still got the same essential elements of what makes it Sasa, the same process that talks about uh, power and gender, uh, power and uh, in dynamics in couples, how we use our power, who has power, why, <laughs> what does it look like, um, what does that look like in decision making in our household, et cetera, still has that. It still has the holistic community engagement. And when we say that, I mean like um, religious leaders in a community uh, being engaged in this over time and integrating this into their premarital counseling sessions or into their sermons, et cetera. I mean market sellers talking with people who come to purchase from them. I mean, people talking with their neighbors and friends in everyday life, it being on local radio stations. There are continuous dialogues throughout the community with a real holistic community engagement. It also looks at a phased approach to change that we can't raise awareness forever and ever, but that communities need not only a new awareness about power and how to use it in our relationships, but also uh, skills to do something different and real actions and local level bylaws or other types of institutional uh, uh, and, and organizational protocols that change. Those types of things go into this phased process. And it's all about benefits. What can we all gain, both, uh, you know, of all genders, um, uh, both in our personal lives and in the community, if there is no violence, if we do something differently. So this revision of SASA took all of the main essentials I just spoke about and was recently launched to kind of a new and improved uh, SASA together. So this, I won't talk in great detail about this, but these are just a few select results of the randomized control trial that perhaps interested people <laughs> to, to replicate SASA in other locations. Um, one of the main things is that all of these results were at a community level which means beyond just the participants that were engaged directly by staff, it means we measured at an entire community level that SASA communities compared to control communities um, had these different results. So most significant change and SASA in Haiti. Haiti was the first adaptation of SASA outside of Uganda. And after five years of work adapting and implementing, SASA is a three-year methodology we took a while to adapt and, <laughs> and tweak it to a new context. It was the first time anyone had tried it. Um, so after five years of that work intensively in communities, before kind of handing over to local level advocacy committees, um, we used most significant change just to see what people thought of it. Um, MSC is totally philosophically <laughs> in line with the SASA methodology and its respect for communities and its uh, kind of, um, allowing for both positive and negative changes to be reported. Like, what do you feel? What do you define as important? Um, accessibility, 
uh, was kind of built in and there were even ideas in the guide that was, were helpful to us. We ended up doing it in Haitian Creole, um, finding ways through interview style uh, work to address literacy issues and really focus on honest feedback. And the process that we used was very much in line with what, uh, what was just presented of what MSC is. But I'll just talk a little bit about that to give you a sense of some of how it could play out. Um, as you know, violence against women and girls, domestic violence, intimate partner violence, is really very loaded and could be very dangerous for people to talk about um, really what's happening to them, which is one of the reasons we used it at uh, the close rather than early on. Um, not wanting to put anyone at risk and also really relying on uh, a certain point of community advancement, if that makes sense, um, in order to ask the question about what's really changed. Not wanting people to feel pressured to say, my relationship changed if it really hadn't had the time to be tested <laughs> and to do so. Um, and for people around them to know that that was really true and to, to be able to, to help them through that. Um, we used the community volunteers that I just mentioned called Community Activists in SASA. Um, we drew on their knowledge and used their recommendations of who would be a good storyteller. Um, and uh, so the stories came in really from very different angles in the community because of that holistic process. We were able to get to a lot of different voices. And then we made sure to select who was going to interview them based on who they'd feel comfortable enough with but also who they wouldn't feel beholden to in any way to say something positive. And we really did a lot of thinking about that. And then basically people went out and interviewed them. I know MSC, it can be someone spontaneously writing a story. Because of literacy levels that wasn't in our communities, wasn't uh, very likely from a lot of different venues, maybe from professional, class, you know, professional folks, but not from everyone. So we did interview style and had people basically write down bullet points um, of what they heard and record if that permission was given what uh, what the story was like my community changed because what I have seen in my family and in my community is the most significant change is and then they wrote these notes and had the recordings staff then typed them up and then those same interviewers went back to the people they interviewed and said and read it aloud to them if necessary if they if they weren't able to read it themselves and said is this what you said is this what you meant and that loop back process really helped us to make sure we were getting <laughs> what people were saying then in the end we had a selection committee that was generated from long lists of people who had been engaged in the program and then we kind of randomly selected per community keeping an eye on gender balance and keeping an eye on making sure people were looking at stories from their own communities and then for each community, we had this 10 person panel, um, removed all the identifying information from all the stories and then had them say which one felt most, one or two that felt most representative to them. And uh, after all of this, the kind of votes came back or the <laughs> consensus came back from each of these committees. And those were the stories that were used. And we really, just to say uh, we did a big debrief <laughs> among staff to talk about how this all worked which is where i'm coming to with what worked well and what some of the challenges were the stories that came back i wish we had time today but the the stories that came back were really quite beautiful um a lot of just really heartfelt like i my marriage is different <laughs> than it was before um not necessarily that there was a great deal of physical violence prior but things like balanced tasks, feeling safe, feeling close to one another and being able to talk with one another were things that kind of across the board got selected and people felt that really happened in their communities. Um, the right people were involved in the community to really get a sense of different perspectives because the whole methodology was about creating relationships. So we had a lot of the relationships that would be needed. We did everything we could to make it accessible and get around really tricky trust issues, which comes to the next point. Um, evaluation in Haiti is not really seen well. <laughs> um, I don't mean by everyone, I mean by communities that experience being evaluated um, or having progress evaluated. There's a lot of mistrust. There's a lot of um, 
keep, you know, entities coming out to ask questions and then they don't see anything after it. And so they're tired of answering questions with nothing ever coming back from it. Um, so part of what worked well is that we waited till later in the process when we had done a lot in the communities. And then what we, what we asked was what they wanted to tell us. And we respected them being able to expound more than we could actually record, but really listening to them and trying to capture what they meant. Um, and that whole process of being iterative and respectful um, was very, very helpful and appreciated. Uh, so we uh, uh, used the stories um, both in Haiti with others um, and in communities, as well as kind of internationally with advocacy and fundraising around uh, violence prevention being possible. Some of the challenges, people making a lot of sweeping statements of change that we kind of doubted. <laughs> and luckily, those were not the stories that made it through the panels. Um, but, you know, some people just really, which begged the question for us, why aren't we getting anything negative back? We know there are frustrations about, you know, we don't pay people in the community and we know that there's, you know, people frustrated about that. So um, there's, uh, there wasn't a lot of negative that come, came back and we're trying to make sure that we can do it in such a way that we would hear that if it's present and when it's present. Involving women and men together, which is really, uh, you know, a principle of SAS is engaging everyone, but, uh, what women defined as success wasn't as clearly brought out. Lack of opportunity for girls' voices to be heard and youth voices generally, which brings me to kind of what we've done next since then. Um, we've created Power to Girls, which is an adaptation of SASA, combining girl-centered programming and community norms change. We've also created a complementary resource pack that can be used with any of those methodologies to prevent violence against women and girls with disabilities. And all of those are being piloted together with research from the Global Women's Institute and we'll be using most significant change in a few months at the end of that implementation. And then all of our methodologies are being scaled through technical support that we offer to, right now there are about eight partners throughout Haiti. And so we're questioning like, would most significant change be an interesting thing to use with all of those partners as well? So, with that, um, I will uh, leave you with a couple of questions that we're still thinking on. We have some ideas in our minds, but we would love your wisdom as well. Um, how can we further improve people's comfort level telling us when they're not happy <laughs> with the programming or what they feel have been negative impacts for themselves or their families or their communities? And what techniques can we use to structure most significant change so that success is defined, led by girls, defined and led by women, defined and led by women and girls with disabilities. So I leave you with those questions in case you have thoughts or comments about them and also welcome any other questions you might have. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, we are going to um, monitor the group chat if you have specific questions for Sarah. If you would like to ask a question verbally, please raise, raise your hand in, which should be beside your name, you um, raise your hand so that uh, I can see if you'd like to ask a question. And I will just select randomly. Um, here's, here's one question, Sarah. Um, when did you select domains of change and what were they? Great. Yeah, so um, that's a good question. Within SASA, there are already existing outcomes for each phase that you're looking at, but in terms of like domains of change within most significant change, um, we really, to be honest, left it quite open to the committees to say, it, or to people interviewing to say, here is what you think. This is very different. I mean, we had a number of other evaluation methods looking at FASA. We had uh, rapid assessment surveys and other focus groups, et cetera, et cetera, that were very more, much more specific about, you know, here are the changes in community, um, what communities know, what communities feel, and what communities do um, at each phase and overall within the three-year process. But one of the nice things about most significant change was actually for us, that it wasn't prescriptive in that way, that we could just say to people, what is the most significant change because of, 
um, Sasa, that you attribute yourselves to Sasa in this community. And they could say anything under the sun. Um, that to us was really a helpful compliment to some of the other evaluation methods, which really were looking at specifically what we had intended to do, if that makes sense. I hope that answers the question. Thank you, Sarah. I have a verbal question um, from Zenap in Istanbul. Uh, hi, thanks for this uh, presentation. It was really interesting. I have one clarification question and one uh, which is actually when you asked, we couldn't really uh, receive negative uh, stories. Um, I was trying to imagine what that would mean and I found it difficult. Like, do you mean whether it's is it neutral or is it like stories of no change? And uh, like, uh, do you think that when you ask a question to the populations, is it uh, to, to the people like, um, uh, maybe it's easier to kind of perceive and bring to memory positive, uh, if, 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 an, if an experience is positive than negative? Like I was thinking all these questions, so it would be great to clarify. And also if there is time, like, could you, explain a bit about um, your comment on challenges involving uh, women and men you said could have been better. Um, I, I couldn't really understand that part, um, engaging them in the most uh, significant uh, change process. Thank you. Great. Thank you for those questions. In terms of negative changes, um, we're really aware uh, in informal relationships that we have with community uh, network members, for example, they're really open about like, we, you know, this didn't work well. <laughs> this, this, you know, a specific thing didn't work well, or you guys are just making women all uppity, or, you know, all kinds of those types of comments end up coming up over time, or this has hurt my relationship, my wife left me because of you people. You know, that kind of thing comes up informally, usually earlier in the process, and then kind of communities start to enough voices in the community start saying something else that it stops being about you know, us or a specific program. It starts looking very, uh, this is just a new normal um, in a positive way. Uh, but those negative changes didn't really come back at all. Um, and so it's very possible that maybe they were neutral and so people just didn't tell stories because it was really neutral or positive. It's possible that's true. We just want to make sure that we have the structure in place as much as possible so that if there are people even by the end of it that are like I know you didn't mean to but the fact that uh, you were talking about violence so much meant that I'm a young woman and my parents didn't let me go out ever anymore you know we wanted to hear that like my life has changed we didn't want to hear that <laughs> but we wanted to if it's there we want to know about it if there were some of those unintentional negative consequences um, but it's very true what you say. It might be that it wasn't there or that people tended to remember the positive. In terms of the challenge around men and women, what I was mentioning was really SASA engages men and women together and the committees, we did a gender balance so that men and women were both on the committees, but we know it, informally that if things haven't really truly changed and that there hasn't been a lot of rethinking and relearning in a lot of contexts and mixed groups, men's opinions prevail. Um, men aren't afraid of speaking up, they've been taught to do so their whole lives, and women will kind of go along with it um, in some contexts, right? And so we wanted to really pull out a little bit more. We felt like, knowing the individuals involved, the women would totally speak up for themselves and that it, there would be a mix of what this whole community feels was the most significant change. But in hindsight, we were also exploring would the outcomes of which stories they selected have been different if it was an all woman panel, <laughs> you know, or if we had separate panels and then put their, you know, this is what the women chose, this is what the men chose, and then kind of, you know, took it, took a look as another piece of data of what those differences were. Thank you, Sarah. We have another question um, from Stephen. Thank you, Kim, and thank you, Sarah, for a very compelling explanation of SASA, how, how you applied it in Haiti, and also how you used MSC to evaluate outcomes in that context. My question first is whether uh, you engaged or how you engaged with uh, civil society and government organizations working 
uh, on or against <laughs> violence against women and girls in Haiti. So I'm thinking of Sofa and Kai Pham, for example, in the women's movement, or the BSEF that represents the governmental mechanism that represents uh, people, including women and girls with disabilities. So did you engage with them? And finally, did you use MSC to assess their perceptions of whether your work was valuable, not just community, but their perceptions and their perceptions of the sustainability of your program? Great questions. And we love, uh, it's nice to hear a Haiti person talk about Sofa and Kai Pham. Um, yeah, and be safe. Um, it, yeah, so essentially, in that period of time, we are in a rural area, Sofa and Kai Pham, uh, Kai Pham specifically, worked only in Port-au-Prince. Um, so we had coordination meetings and talked to them about what we were doing and all of that, but we work in two geographically different areas um, at the time. Um, SOFA had offices in uh, two of the communities where we worked and we coordinated with them. We uh, participated in mutual trainings. They were part of, <laughs> of the whole process um, at that local level uh, because we work in more rural areas. Um, the national office knew of our existence but wasn't as uh, daily <laughs> involved in the programming. Um, I would have to look back to see whether any of their particular staff were uh, submitted stories. Oh yeah, you know what? One submitted stories. I don't know if they were on review panels because I remember her story. Um, in any case, that kind of local level iterative process, and in a lot of ways, the accountability back in that epoch of time for us was accountability back to the communities in which we were working. And sustainability with Sasa generally is quite high because you still have the same religious leaders that were engaged, they're still preaching, they're still, you know, <laughs> there's still all of the entities that have been engaged over time that have made real changes. The only difference is you're not there every day, but they're all still there and they've all worked together before. So it tends to have quite a high sustainability potential. Since then, we've done a lot more thinking about our own position in the women's movement in Haiti and how we can coordinate better with them um, and how we, uh, with, with other entities within it. Some of our technical support partners are very strongly within the women's movement in Haiti, um, not Sofa and Kai Pham particularly, uh, that are using SASA, but a number of organizations, Fundacion Toya, I mean, we could talk offline <laughs> about, about what that all looks like. Um, but I think it's a really incredibly important point and a potential for use of MSC in Haiti around SASA to get some perspectives from other entities in the women's movement that would know about it, that have had it in their communities or that have had some uh, contact with it, uh, to get their opinions about it and to get their feedback on it. In terms of Be Safe, we work, uh, uh, we work closely with them now on the Violence Against Women and Girls with Disabilities module that's called Safe and Capable. And I could talk about the specifics of this all day long. So <laughs> I wanted to flag one question in the chat and then we'll move on to Cheyenne. But the one question, if you could respond to quickly in the chat, is the link between most significant change, the, the a link or the differentiation from MSC and outcome harvesting and the uh, use for impact. Um, evaluation. I'm sorry, could you, could you say the question again? Well, people are wanting to know if they link between the most significant chain, if you've had experience with outcome harvesting and how you would differentiate that, and then just using most significant change generally for impact evaluation. Um, to speak to the second part of it, I don't have experience with outcome harvesting, sorry. <laughs> so maybe Cheyenne would be a better place to, to speak to that question when she, when she responds. Um, in terms of uh, impact evaluation with MSC, I feel like it's a really, de depending on your methodology, I think it's a really helpful way. Um, if it's used by itself, I think there are some pieces that you might not get to about what you intended to accomplish necessarily. Um, but I, I feel like, Having it as a complement um, 
is a really strong method, a really helpful method, because it is so iterative and leaves so much power in the hands of the community to say what they experienced, um, positive or negative, even though sometimes negative, get, bringing out that negative is a challenge. Neutral, positive, negative can all come up. And because, generally speaking, uh, they can say things you didn't even intend to do um, that ended up being positive unintended outcomes. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I want to leave you thinking about uh, some questions that are coming up in chat. So when we wrap up, you can respond to them. So uh, some people would really like to hear your own responses to the questions you posed on your slide. And then another question is, how did you translate your results from MSC into quantitative uh, information, quantitative data? So with that, um, I'd like to wrap this part up and then we'll have another sort of case study on the use of most significant change from Cheyenne. So I wanted to introduce Cheyenne um, Church. Um, Cheyenne is a professor at, um, well, sorry, let me start first. Her education is around international relations from the London School of Economics and Political Science. She's a professor of practice of aid effectiveness and human security at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University. And there she co-directs the Corruption, Justice and Legitimacy Project. Um, Cheyenne's also founder of VESA boutique firm specialized in evaluation performance measurement, measurement learning processes, program design, etc. Um, she's held positions uh, with Search for Common Ground, the CDA Collaborative, and International Conflict Research Initiative. So I'd like to hand it over to uh, Cheyenne. share my screen. There we go. Super. Um, Sarah, that was a great presentation. I also had a lot of questions. Um, so thank you for that. And thanks to Kim for the invitation to participate today. Um, for me, and I'll just, I believe I just need to move one thing to make that better for everyone. Um, there. For me, the topic that was selected today couldn't be more interesting. It combines two things that I think need more collective attention, and that's how we can catalyze change related to power, which is effectively what anti-corruption seeks to do, and then how do we understand if change is happening, which is what monitoring and evaluation seeks to do. As Kimberly said, I'm a professor of practice at the Fletcher School, where I get to teach design, monitoring, and evaluation of international development and peace building. But being a professor of practice means that I still have time and I'm expected to continue my practice. And one of the ways that I'm currently doing that is as the co-director of the Corruption Justice and Legitimacy Program. And that's a theory to practice initiative and we're trying to increase the effectiveness of anti-corruption uh, programming in context of endemic corruption. Um, what I'm gonna talk about today is um, why we picked MSC as a monitoring tool for one of the projects of the Corruption Justice and Legitimacy Program, how we implemented it, and then some of our lessons and challenges. And it's interesting, there is some overlap with Sarah's presentation. So why most significant change? Well, to talk about why, we have to talk a little bit about what. What was our anti-corruption project? The project's name was Coletta Haki, which is Kiswahili for provide justice. And we were working with CDA out of Boston and RCN, a Belgian-based nonprofit, on this project in Lumumbashi DRC. The project itself was based on a corruption analysis that we had conducted using systems thinking. And by representing corruption as a system within the police and courts, because the sector we were interested in was the criminal justice system in the first two segments, so police courts, but not yet corrections. Um, to represent corruption of the system, we used causal loop mapping, one loop of which you can see in the slide. The full system map contains multiple loops. And as we um, used causal loop mapping to understand the system of corruption in the police and courts, a leverage point became very clear. 
Well, corruption was the norm. It was everywhere. There were these islands of integrity. And islands of integrity was the name we gave to people who would be repeatedly referenced that they attempted to follow the rules of the law when they could. So in interviews that we were conducting for the corruption analysis, people would reference a court clerk, a judge, a lawyer, a traffic police officer, a police officer in a station who go try to find them. They're good, they try to follow the rules. And, we, and that came up systematically enough that we felt that this possibly could be the leverage point. So the goal of the project that we stood up was to enable these islands of integrity to come together to work collectively to address corrupt practices in the justice system. Simplifying it greatly, it was kind of a classic safety and numbers strategy or a collective action program. But what was unique about it was that we were engaged with the power holders, the duty bearers. This wasn't focused on citizen collective action, but collective action within those who have the power. And if you understand corruption, which is the abuse of power for personal gain, it's the duty bearer or the power holder that is really key, though not only, to that transaction. So that was what was unique about it. We brought them together and what we believed was, if these people on their own, with all the pressures to do differently, did stand up and follow the rules, what might they be able to do more or better if they were able to work together? If we provided them moral support, if they felt they needed any sort of technical guidance that we could source for them, um, advice, even just connections within the system to be able to stand up for following the law or the rules. So that's the program in a nutshell. So with that in mind, why did we pick most significant change? And we used MSC as part of our monitoring process, though it, was ended, it ended up being helpful in our evaluations as well. It was a monitoring tactic for us. And we picked it for three reasons. First, you can't directly measure corruption, or at least it's extraordinarily difficult. Second was indicators weren't feasible given the situation. And similar to Sarah, we also wanted information on what we called harm, but unintended negative. And I'll talk about each of these. So, First, we knew a direct measurement of amount or degree of corruption was going to be fraught with challenges. And there's really, I could do a whole webinar on all the challenges of that, but just to flag a few. Once you step outside of a fiscal interpretation of corruption, where then you have to determine what counts as corruption. Cronyism, nepotism, favoritism, sextortion, it becomes quite difficult to determine what you're measuring. So, before you even get into the how you're going to measure it. If we chose to stick within a strict fiscal corruption type interpretation, that too becomes full of challenges. Is it the amount of money that gets um, exchanged or is it the frequency of these exchanges? So to help, to help think about it, what's worse, a thousand bribes of a dollar or one bribe of a thousand dollars? So even fiscal interpretations are difficult. We considered thinking about the project loss or the public harm or the public loss from corruption transactions, but then you've got a real chain of events and you've got a time lag challenge. So it became really hard to try and think about how do we monitor with a direct measurement approach. And of course, there's the social desirability bias concern where people tell you what they think you want to hear. So we thought we can't do a direct measurement approach. It's simply not gonna work. The second driver that we had is we had an innovative program with staff that were quite new to theory of change thinking. So the combination between um, really an adaptive management type style of programming with staff that were just learning theory of change thinking made traditional indicator centric m and &E pretty difficult to adopt. And there's a variety of reasons for that. I'll just give you one. So we had a clear goal. We knew what we were trying to, trying to achieve from a goal perspective, but our, our objectives, we were very comfortable evolving them as we knew more, as we engaged more, and as we built our relationships with these islands of integrity. To have indicators that are useful over a period of time, your statements of change need to be pretty static, so your indicators are continually assessing against those statements of change. And ours were regularly evolving. At the same time, this innovative program, one of the central principles was ownership by these islands of integrity. We provided a platform and support. They told us where and how they wanted that, what would make more sense. And we really felt that most significant change respected 
that um, and possibly could reinforce it. And I'll talk to you, I'll talk a little bit more about that later. The third issue was we had real concern that the program could unintentionally do harm. Again, echoes of what Sarah was talking about. Our program was working with police and judiciary. And these are sectors that are very well known for their conservative nature. And when you add that into the context of the DRC, where this sector in many ways exists to support the status quo in terms of power, we had real concerns that if we started to challenge, truly challenge, not just at the periphery, but truly challenge some of the elements of power, um, what kind of ramifications could be for these individuals? And so we wanted to absolutely have a way that we would start to hear and understand if there were positive, but also clearly negative um, results of our programming. So those are the reasons that we, that we ended up picking most significant change. What did we actually do? We had a process. First, we had to train our team. And for that, we, we went right back to source. We went to the uh, Most Significant Change Manual by Rick Davies. It's online for free. It's great. Um, and so we trained the team. Then we had to adapt or filter it to the context and our project. For us, working with the police officers that we were working with and the judicial officials, writing was not going to be a problem. And in fact, really played to their strengths. They were accustomed to having to write and document. So really that piece of it didn't need to change. Um, one thing that we were quite concerned about was the amount of time that was gonna be needed to complete the process. So there's the gathering of the stories, the bringing it back. And like all people, pe these folks are busy, but we were also competing with schedules. We had judges involved and they had court to go and sit in so, and, and be present and preside over and police officers who had their, their um, shift to be on. So we really had to think carefully about the time factor. So what we ended up doing is we broke it into a two-step process. We had a first story collection, um, and then we had a small committee um, that was selected by the participants, pick the, um, identify the stories of significance, and then we fed them back in a second part of a meeting. And I'll talk more later about what ended up actually happening in terms of time. Um, and then finally, we had real concerns about the validation part. As Kim laid out in her five-step um, slide at the beginning, verify is the final stage. And we were very concerned about this because we were building relationships of trust and respect with this select set of, of, of um, islands of integrity. And to say that we were gonna take their story and then go out and validate or verify them, it felt disrespectful. And it felt like it could undermine some of the, some of the relationship building that the, program, that the project had been endeavoring to achieve. We also thought getting accurate information would be really, really tricky. So someone would say, I refused a bribe. A judge, for instance, would say, I refused a bribe to change my verdict on a case. So we'd have to go and find the, the alleged briber and ask them, hey, did you try and bribe your way out of this case? We just couldn't imagine any, any scenario where we would get any sort of accurate information for that. So instead, what we did is we felt that when we brought the stories back, to the group, we read them in full, and that community is not a very large community, and we hope that there would be some means of, um, of internal group validation, because telling a total fabrication um, would probably get called out at some level. So once we'd adapted it and, figured, and trained the team, we then ran a test with a small, a small group of the leadership of this um, growing network that, that we were building. And the big feedback there was really getting clear on our questioning. We obviously had thought our questioning was, was clear, but um, they, they really pushed us to improve how we set up our initial questions, which bounces off of the domain of change idea. We then ran it twice. We ran it with six months in between, in between each other. And in effect, what we did is we provided some, we provided some guidance. We invited everybody in the network who had been a participant for a certain period of time, not the new folks. Um, we, for those who were able to attend, we, in, we explained the process. We gave them 30 minutes to write their story. Um, we then, the committee took it away. We, we served a nice lunch. The committee took it away, used criteria that the whole group had um, established for picking the most significant change. Um, after lunch, then the committee brought back and read the three stories that were picked. 
and at which point we attempted to facilitate a discussion around why those stories had significance. What about them really made them matter? Um, and I'll talk a bit later about how that actually ended up turning out. Um, we learned a lot from the first one. We tweaked it a smidge, um, again, around the instructions um, and, and our process, and then we ran it a second time. We got tremendously useful information. Um, we got tremendously useful information in terms of the types of change that people were experiencing from the first um, edition, the first most significant change data collection. It really came out a lot of sort of attitudinal and aha moments for what people had experienced. From the second, it was much more behavioral. I'm doing or I'm, I'm encouraging others to do things, things differently. And that was really useful for us in understanding how better to support and what was a value versus not a, not a value. I'm going to say a few of our lessons that we, that we learned. I think I pulled up five. So the storytelling um, aspect of it fit extraordinarily well culturally, both for the, our group, the documentation, but then the feeding back. That worked well, people really appreciated it and, um, and took to it well. However, it ended up taking a huge amount of time. We had set it up uh, theoretically that we would do, do some work, they'd have lunch while the committee reviewed according to their criteria, then we'd have another, let's say, hour feedback and discussion and they'd be gone, kind of a long lunch, they could go back to work. And that's what they had reported that would work best for them. Um, it actually ended up taking about three quarters of a day. And it was a desire to provide lots of detail. The story writing took a lot more time. They were very committed. They wanted to know um, that they were doing it right. So they wanted a lot of feedback. And the discussion afterwards um, turned into a much bigger and longer and more engaged conversation. So it did take far more of their time than we had anticipated. One of the things that happened that we had thought might happen a little bit and you hear it when you read about examples of most significant change being applied and it absolutely happened here but it happened more so than we had thought people got competitive about whose story was picked now people were they, the story documented were anonymous but we're not working in a broad village or community context we're working with the network so you know there was only so many judges only so many court clerks that could have written that particular story so it was it was, we didn't have names, but it, you couldn't pretend that you couldn't figure out who that story might belong to. So the group got competitive about whose story got picked. After the first session, there was gentle teasing, joking that the selection committee had um, used favoritism, which was kind of funny, but kind of not as an anti-corruption effort in terms of whose story got picked. And by session two, so six months later, um, when we were just reviewing, well, here's the criteria we're going to use to pick um, the stories. And I'll just say the committee was three network members plus one project team member. Um, the group asked that nobody whose story got picked in the first session would be allowed to have their story picked in the second session, which we agreed to because that was the, the group consensus, but it didn't really work in alignment with the most significant change process of letting the most significant story gurgle to the top. So the competition um, concerned us. Um, conversely, while that was concerning, what was uh, heartening was it really did increase the group cohesion, which is all part and parcel of the strength and numbers theory of change, that people feel connected and supported. And this, and it really where we found the group cohesion coming up was in that discussion where we had intended a discussion about around why is this significant. What people wanted to discuss was, well, why did you take that action? Or I've experienced that before and I tried this other. And it became very much a sharing of strategies of how to buffer or rebuff um, corrupt pressure. And that was entirely in alignment with what our whole program was about. So we thought that was really, a, really a, a wonderful unintended result. Whilst we weren't getting what we had um, intended around understanding significance, that was okay, we thought, in terms of a trade-off, because this advanced what we had, we were working in terms of bringing these people together. Um, so we had competition, but we also had increased cohesion. Finally, very similarly to what Sarah mentioned, is we were looking for both positive and negative stories. 
and we surfaced no negative stories as well. And we tweaked our process in the second session more to try and, to try and encourage a really open-ended. Um, are your colleagues no longer speaking to you because they are tired of you talking about anti-corruption? Are you getting explicit pressure from your boss? Have you been transferred, um, if you're a police officer, to a really undesirable location because you're not paying up the money that is expected of you? And we also surfaced no, none of these stories that would be reasonable to expect. We also don't know they happened, so it's not like there was people were hiding, but we don't know. So to close things off, we have a lot more information about Coletta Haki on our website. If you're interested, I'd recommend starting at the Corruption and Fragile States blog. We've blogged about our theory of change. We blogged about our corruption analysis, about the most significant change process, our midterm, and our final evaluations. It's all up on the blog connected to the actual publications. If you're interested more in the system side, we've connected there to our publication on how to do systems mapping for corruption analysis. Um, so yeah, there's tons more um, information up there. But that's a lot of me talking. So. Um, Similar to Sarah, I have a couple of questions. I'm really happy to talk about any aspect of this that may or may be of interest or value to you. But two of the things that we were left pondering after um, was, is story validation possible for anti-corruption programming? How could you ever do that in a way that would get you accurate information? And I think it probably transcends to other forms of corruption, other forms of programming as well. And then finally, this, this balance between does the information warrant the time burden on participants um, and weighing that up? So thank you for listening to that. And I hope it met some of your needs and I'm happy to talk about any other, other aspect of it. Thank you, Cheyenne. That was very interesting. Um, we've, um, while people can raise their hand, I have an initial question that asked about how you were able to navigate the buy-in well, access and buy-in, you know, to uh, law enforcement, to judges and police. Um, and when mapping your system, how did you determine when and where to stop? Like, where were you going to drill down? And where were you going to focus? Okay, so some systems questions. Yeah, no, great, great question. So navigating buy-in buy into the, um, the criminal justice system we did it through local contacts and so we didn't do it formally we didn't um, get official sanction we did go to kinshasa and meet with the ministry and inform them of what we were doing we felt that was important from a protection of our staff perspective um, but we didn't get an edict that people had to talk talk with us um, we went went to the Mumbashi and reached out through various contacts from prior from prior work and people, each individual who ended up participating in the program, they navigated their attendance personally. And what I mean by that is some wanted us to write a formal letter so that person could take it to their boss and their boss knew. And some said, no, I'm gonna do this all on my own time. And so we, we respected the needs of each individual about how they wanted us to engage. Because in some cases, if we worked through the hierarchy, they'd be told not to engage. And they said, no, no, I, I'm a judge and I definitely want to be here. So that's how we navigated buy-in. In terms of boundaries of systems, always so tricky, and I'm not sure I'll, I'll give you a very satisfactory answer on this. We were, due to our donor, um, constrained to the criminal justice system. So that's the boundary we, we used. And because of IRB access, getting into corrections, getting into prisons is extraordinarily difficult. So we um, bounded it with uh, law enforcement and, and judiciary. So that's how we ended up bounding the initial system. Um, Kim, I think you're on mute. There we go. Uh, another, another question goes about the time because you mentioned it was a very lengthy process perhaps it took longer than you thought was there pushback in that regard regarding the time requirement say from police or other actors um, if they didn't complain about it in the end was it was it a burden yeah no great great question 
They didn't complain about it, as I recall, in process at the time. They, they really enjoyed the process. They enjoyed the lunch. We always made sure we gave the folks a nice lunch. They were taking time out of their day that they were going to have to make up. So we tried to treat them well and, and respectfully. So in the instance of the actual mono, of the actual event, no complaints. Where it would come up is later when we were when, for the next for the next meeting or the next informal session, um, people would say, oh, the time and the time it takes. So it was almost like it was a bit of a, of a dilemma for them themselves. They really enjoyed and valued engagement, but then like every professional on this call would go back to a full slate, slate of work. So, um, so yeah, so they didn't complain. So going back to the end part of your question, Kim, is it really a burden if there isn't complaints? Well, I'm not sure, I guess it's not for me to decide, it's, but it is something that I worry about because I think we ask for a lot. We ask for a lot as a, as a nonprofit sector, as the international community, and we ask for it. And are we always sure make, that we're making the right balance between there's gonna be that much value back to the community? So it's something that I, that I think about a lot. But I take the point, if they didn't say it, maybe it's not up to me to decide. <laughs> The, does anyone have a verbal or other um, question for, I see one, one of the participants, uh, Stephen Barani from Ottawa U, has I wondered if you could go back to the slide that has your references on it. Absolutely. There we go. We haven't been engaging with Cheyenne precisely because um, of finding her blog, the blogs from the project so so interesting, and so I'm happy to engage with that. I guess I wonder, uh, Cheyenne, as we sort of wrap up this uh, section, or if there's, uh, I don't see anyone's hand up. I hope I'm not missing that or other questions. If you have any responses or reflections on the own, your question that you posed. Oh, um, well, with regards to, is it possible? I don't think it's possible. And I wonder, I wonder, is there alternative ways to verify and validate if, if that don't disrespect um, people and that was particularly because we knew and were in contact with the, it was a smaller group not not a village i'd be interested to know what if sarah what sarah thought about um how they verified and if how they navigated that if there was concerns but i also understand that there was a much broader grouping so it may not have the same the same um challenges Sorry. Are there any other any other questions for Cheyenne? Um, if oh, here's a hand. We have a, a hand up, so I will um, ask uh, Amaya. Yes, thank you. Go ahead. Uh, thanks. And I should say a former student of Cheyenne, so great to be hearing from her again. Uh, question, I think, to both Cheyenne and Sarah. It, it strikes me, listening to both of you, that uh, there is an element of sequencing involved in that this methodology seems to depend quite heavily on strong relationship building. Uh, of course, any evaluation methodology is going to come relatively late in the process. Uh, but if the nature of the intervention is not one that is focused on relationship building or service delivery, not something that is specifically giving something to the community, uh, do you think something like this is either feasible or advisable? Um, hi, Amaya. Nice, nice to hear you. Um, yes and no. So. I think you can, you can do it. Um, I think you can use most significant change. If the programming is, um, has had sufficient reach or penetration into a, 
into a community and, and, and get value of it. I think you can use most significant change in a variety of contexts, but to get value of it, um, unless the topic is sensitive. And then I think when you have sensitive change topics, I think that's where the relationship comes in and that's where the, the trust becomes important and necessary. Um, but I think it is more broadly, broadly applicable than projects that are um, centered around relationships. Sarah, what do you, what do you think? Yeah, that's a, I think that's a really, really nice way to look at it um, and would agree with you, Cheyenne. I, I feel like uh, I'm not an evaluation person per se. I'm a violence against women and girls person, <laughs> prevention person. Um, and within violence against women and girls prevention, I wouldn't recommend most significant change unless there was some form of uh, means for follow-up. There'd have to be a lot of safety valves looking at a lot of the ethical considerations around research in general, making sure that uh, there is some benefit to the community for stirring up an issue that's really quite painful and delicate for a lot of people. And that's not maybe unique for most significant change. That's research in general on violence against women and girls. <laughs> so. I see a, a common thread in some of the questions from earlier during Sarah's presentation, and again now uh, a chat for a uh, question for Cheyenne, and that is how did you um, present results, the qualitative results, but then also were you able to generate quantitative results as well? Um, and then how did you use the, the results of the MSC? Uh, to inform any future programming. Um, I'll start, Sarah, if that, and then, then um, so we used the results in the MSC in a couple of different ways. We used it absolutely um, uh, in terms of thinking about the types of support we were, we were offering. So in the first MSC round, we got a lot of attitudinal realization type. That was the most significant change. Like, I had no idea that this small action of corruption actually had these kind of ripple effects that created such communal challenges and like disrespect for legal obedience and those kind of ramifications. And that was tremendous because that creates opportunity to, to discuss. We were very keen to know that we had behavior change in the second one, and we were watching for that because the realization, while absolutely important, if it doesn't translate to behavior change, then we're not going to shift the needle around corruption in the justice sector. So we used it between one and two, not only for what we watched for, but also we changed our programming so that our conversations, um, I shouldn't say it so, so definitively, we changed our programming we raised questions with the group when we were suggesting ideas, like to make sure that we, we were putting up as many ideas around um, how to learn what actions they could take, how to support each other, um, to help move from realization to, to behavior. And then like with everything, we raised it, and then if they picked, they picked, and if they didn't, we said, okay, that's where, that's where you're at. So it informed our programming, number one. Number two, we captured, we documented all of our stories, um, transcribed them, and then they were used in um, our, our evaluation. Um, our external evaluators took that material and, and used it. Um, and so they, it informed our programming and it was used in our evaluation as well. Uh, Sarah? Yeah. Um, it also, uh, as we had kind of that two-tiered process of we had a whole bunch of stories generated and then the committees picked a few, we had kind of two different levels of what we looked at. We looked at all of the stories internally to, to inform our programming. And that's where uh, one of the stories that didn't win because it was from a very particular perspective was one, the one that I mentioned that was from one of the other uh, women's organization uh, staff uh, that was talking about like, you guys do prevention, we do response, and this has been huge for us. <laughs> like this, is, this has been helpful, blah, blah, blah. That informed us in terms of, and some of the other things she said, informed us in terms of how do we engage with other women's organizations from the outset, like what does that look like? What could be the potential benefit? How do we frame this to communities? Um, there were a number of stories there that helped us to look at what it is that we were hoping to do. And in fact, um, a couple of those stories that were about uh, uh, young women and some of the feedback we were getting with young women uh, helped uh, influence our uh, adaptation of SASA to create power to girls that's around girls specifically. So there were certainly examples of informing programming um, and feeding into some of our other feedback mechanisms. 
there was also those particular stories that were selected by the communities. There was kind of a, a winner per community. And those were, we contacted the person that told that story um, across the board. They were really thrilled that they got chosen. <laughs> and so we got, uh, we got photos uh, with their permission, designed those stories and had them out and available in the community and in, uh, we actually used some of them as we entered into new communities with community leaders saying, here is what some of the, the other community members who have been through this process said, what do you think about us working together in your community? Um, so some of that was used like programmatically and it was also translated to English and was used uh, for fundraising purposes with those people's permission uh, to help us keep going. <laughs> so this is, this is the reality of a, a nonprofit. Um, so there were a number of different things there. Uh, that I feel like were really um, very helpful in terms of the information that was gleaned. In terms of the quantitative question, I feel like this is one method and one method can't do everything. We didn't, and I know there are ways to code and glean and look for, um, we didn't do it on a scale that we had quantitative application for this. We used it as one method among other methods like a rapid assessment survey that gave us some of the quantitative community-wide information that we need. Um, in future, as we're collaborating with the Global Women's Institute uh, on a quasi-experimental study, there will be significant uh, both quantitative and qualitative data. This will be an additional method. And part of the reason we still want to use it, despite all of that <laughs> huge amount of, of data that they're generating, is for that really iterative ability to tap into what the community feels is the priority. There's no predetermined uh, uh, objective from our end other than hearing from them about what they felt was significant to them. Thank you, um, Sarah and Cheyenne. I have a, a question from a participant. Um, her name's Kim, who's still wanting to ask the question. Now I've sort of lost. She there, yes. <laughs> Sorry, technical. I've unmuted you, Kim, so please go ahead. Hi, thank you. Thank you, Kim. Thank you, Sarah and Cheyenne. This has been um, really helpful. Do you hear me? I just should make sure. Yes. Okay. Um, there are several things that I'm thinking about as I was hearing your presentations and both in terms of the value of this evaluation process um, to, as you mentioned, build trust and actually support programming. So that's one, you know, advantage of some evaluation techniques. Um, but I, and, and I'm also, but I also see the, the issues associated with using it as a monitoring technique where depending on the situation, you could have some kind of competition come in and actually affect you know, how you can use the data. Um, I also though appreciated hearing that in both cases, and I've worked on, on a large anti-corruption program in Nigeria, um, and I'm also working in anti-human trafficking programs, these are areas where there may be an end goal that is clear, but how you get there and the links, as you point out, the results, I mean, I mean, not the results change, but the, well, the results change is one way of saying this, but the, the corruption chains and identifying those corruption chains clearly and identifying how you interrupt those appropriately or the most, you know, use your resources most appropriately is often um, hard to pinpoint, hard to determine. And, the external and internal feedbacks and drivers within the system are also sometimes hard to um, identify. When I'm thinking about most significant change here, if you can actually get the information, um, I could picture it, because both of you appear to be using it for programmatic purposes, um, supporting the development of a clearer theory of change. Um, so I just wanted to get your thoughts on that. Um. I agree. That's my thought. <laughs> no. um, uh, yeah, Kim, I think you're 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 spot on. I think you could use it in a really iterative feedback type way if you had enough access to people ongoing to almost real time map out how people were experiencing change processes. 
Um, and I think it could be really a really interesting way of, of doing it. Totally. That's a great idea. Just to keep bearing in mind uh, people's fatigue of, of the process. It is a, an intensive process. <laughs> so you want to be really clear about at what points you're collecting that information. But absolutely, I think it's a fantastic idea too. I will flag one thing that I didn't bring up, not because it wasn't important, but just because of time. You start to worry about how the stories affect the next round of stories, I have to say. So just as I was sort of real time thinking about if you continually did it, what would be the consequence of like if we'd run a third round of MSC where people had heard what had won, although we never used that language, but people definitely interpreted that my story won. Does that do you create an effect on your on your um, on your, in our case, on our, the participants in our program, as they think about how, what story to offer. Are they offering a story? Well, that story won last time, so I'm going to provide this. Now, if you're in a much bigger, more diffuse community type environment, you might not have that unintended negative feedback loop, but we were very conscious that if we keep doing this, does that competitive piece start to impact the kind of information people provide? So you'd have to think about that too for a bounded project like we had. Thank you. I have another question. Um, um, Zeynep, you had a question. And then um, I yeah, I was, I was actually, I have to, now I have two questions after Cheyenne's uh, <laughs> comments, which was very interesting. But first, uh, I was actually wondering, uh, as uh, Sarah was talking, I was wondering um, how uh, this most significant change method, because it's based on stories, how it would actually resonate with the communities, uh, especially if they have a strong oral tradition. Because for example, uh, in my native country, I'm from Turkey, like especially the Kurds uh, in the Southeast, they have this uh, oral tradition of they have their stories. Uh, it's called Dengbej, like th these are stories that are sang, like so, and everybody like even illiterate, like especially actually illiterate, people like they memorize these and they kind of sing these across generations and it's a way of kind of really uh, informing the young uh, generations about their history. So I was kind of really thinking whether like these positive stories of change uh, could be used or I mean this is more it's not really a question it's, it's more like I was really uh, kind of imagining daydreaming in a way about this. Um, uh, could these be used as also part of an oral tradition combined to pass on to generations and um, um, young girls, uh, etc.? This is one thing. And um, the second one, um, I'm I'm not so much familiar with the most significant change method, so I hope it doesn't sound uh, very ignorant. But uh, like uh, to Cheyenne, like could you have skipped the discussion part in the first phase, for example? Like could you like to what extent can you? really uh, adopt the method so that it's actually loyal to its core but also adapts like because I, I mean I'm kind of thinking out loud right now but I was imagine, like you could have them bring the stories in but then you could maybe do the discussion in the second round with both um, like a selection for the first and then a selection for the second phase but like having the discussion together like do things like that make sense changes like this um, great questions, um, and, and I, I, I appreciate your sort of processing it through. Um, I, think you, I think it would depend on your group and your process. So technically speaking, sure, I think you could say thank you for the stories and, and we'll feed them back at, at, a later, at a later date. For this group, it wouldn't have worked. They were very, um, they were very clear that this was their group and meeting their needs and they would not have liked it. They would have felt that that was extractive. And it, 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 um, I don't think, I don't believe they would have um, liked that kind of proposal for this group. But in, in, um, in theory, yeah, I think you can adapt and, and think things through for contexts, um, for different contexts. And just in terms of oral tradition, I think this is a tremendous methodology for, for um, groups that are more oral storytelling. You just have to figure out a way to be able to capture it so that you can pull it all to pull it all together. But you know, that's that's a that's an easy problem to fix. I think it aligns really nicely for an oral tradition. 
Totally. Just another comment about the oral tradition. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. And that's part of how it ends up still in some ways being used that staff has now read these stories of change and are like, we heard and they don't, you know, unless without permission, um, the, win you know, the winning stories, we didn't use that terminology either, but that's how everyone sees it. But the, the stories that were selected uh, were then public. Um, and so they tell those stories um, when they're talking to other people, they tell those stories of like, and we encourage people, it in there's already such a culture of giving testimonies about your experience um, in Haiti. I wanted to thank everyone for participating in the discussion today. Um, I found it um, very enriching. Uh, I wanted to just summarize now. I think we've heard that most significant change you know, is one of a number of qualitative research uh, methodologies that can be used for both monitoring and evaluation. Um, it's obviously has some benefits given that it is flexible and it's highly participatory. Um, I think it's important to highlight Cheyenne's comment um, about the methodology, <coughs> excuse me, shifting power. Um, people who are often can be defensive and they're, they're the subjects of the uh, monitoring or evaluation and this methodology allows them um, to take some of that power back and be thoroughly engaged and active in, in the monitoring or evaluation and of course the learning um, and the decisions around what are the most important results. Um, during the discussion, we heard about some lessons that are important to keep in mind, some lessons learned. Um, first, how important it is to establish trust um, and to ensure the storytellers are, are comfortable in sharing positive changes, but also any negative effects or problems that they had vis-a-vis -vis the development initiative. Um, another uh, point that was made that it is fairly um, time consuming and it's per perhaps not as uh, a quick uh, methodology that some external evaluators um, can necessarily apply um, completely in a short period of time. So it does take some planning and some steps to, uh, to move through the different phases. Um, it's also important to establish the criteria for how the group is going to select the stories to use and to present uh, as part of their monitoring or evaluation work. So you're doing that in advance of the, of the actual decision making ensures that there's the parameters are clear from the outset and it can minimize any of that competition that was, was mentioned. So again, I wanted to thank um, Sarah Siebert and Cheyenne Church for their um, interesting and provocative uh, presentations today and for engaging with some of the participants. I also wanted to thank everyone who registered through the um, G-Local evaluation platform and good luck with all of your uh, future uh, qualitative research, monitoring, evaluation, and learning endeavors. We are uh, going to put the recording up um, on our website and or on our Facebook page, but we'll make sure it's public soon. And um, we can also give some links on our Facebook page to some of the some of the most significant change uh, methodology work from different sites. Thank you very much again. Thank you for joining Just Governance Group today.